She is a senior fellow at the California-based Pacific Research Institute, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal contributor, and the author of three books. She is also an instructor at California's Command College and serves on the board of trustees for Singularity University. Her new book, 100 Plus, observes that humanity is on the cusp of an exciting longevity revolution. She examines the social, economic, and cultural impact of a 100 plus year lifespan and argues that society should rally to support and embrace longevity science and technology. Please welcome Sonia Arison. Thank you. Um, let's see, we're, uh, which is the, uh, this is the clicker, I guess, for the, oh, for the PowerPoint. Um, yes, so this is a copy of my new book. Uh, hopefully most of you have managed to grab a copy. Uh, they're out there, and I think the Teal Foundation is giving them away complimentary, but I'm, I've been told that they don't have enough. So if you don't have one and you want one, you should probably pick one up before they all go. Uh, so in, in the book, um, and by the way, uh, Dr. Badalak is one of my heroes. I, I go over his work and the work of other people uh, in chapter two of the book. And so the book takes a look at how science and technology are going to allow us to live longer and healthier lives. And I try to put the emphasis on healthier because it's not just about radical life extension. It's about health extension. We want to be healthier longer. We don't want to just live longer. Um, and that's what, uh, what should be able to happen through a revolution in, in biotechnology or regenerative medicine. Uh, so I take in the, the premise of the book is that we might be able to double our life expectancy, our health expectancy, to 150 years during my lifetime. Uh, I'm 39 years old uh, right now. Uh, and that's roughly a doubling of current life expectancy. Uh, we're around 80 today. Uh, but so what? I mean, other people have said things like this before. This is not new. I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, that's what the rest of the book is about, the so what part. So what if we can live longer and healthier lives? How does that change the world? What does that even mean for us? I mean, how does it affect the economy, our family lives, even religion? And so these are some of the topics that I cover in the book, and, and I'm going to go over them. Uh, but before I do, let me just, ah, yes, that works, good. Uh, go over some history. Uh, this, this is the life expectancy chart. Ray had a great uh, chart earlier with all the, the international uh, uh, life expectancies and how they bounced up and down. Um, this, is, uh, this is a smaller graph, but you can see in the Cro-Magnon area we're only living to around 18 years. At the time of the European Renaissance, it was only around 30. By 1850, life expectancy was 43, and today we're, we're up near 80 uh, in, in America. Um, and it, of course, it's higher than that in other countries. Monaco is around 90 years. And some people will look at this chart and say, oh, yes, but the only reason why we've got that nice line is because we've tackled all the low, we've taken all the low-hanging fruit. We've tackled all the easy things, right? Like nutrition helped us live longer, and um, fighting infectious disease, germ theory, antibiotics. Uh, and that's all true. I mean, those are reasons why we're living longer, because we tackled the things that were killing us early on, and that makes sense, of course, for us to deal with those things first. Uh, but the reason why the chart continues to go up in the second half of the 20th century, the reason why that line continues to go up is because of the advances that have been made after age 65. We're now starting to work on the things that kill us at the end of life. And that's the exciting part. I mean, that's, this is really just the beginning of the story. So what's going to take us there? Dr. Badalat told us a little bit about some of the exciting things that are happening in regenerative medicine, the ability to grow back muscle, uh, the ability to grow brand new organs, uh, windpipes and bladders, and in the lab, hearts and lungs have been done for, for rats. And, uh, and that's very exciting. Gene therapy is another thing that's incredibly exciting because that allows us to hack the human code. Just like computers are built on ones and zeros, humans also have a code of the ACT and G of DNA. We've sequenced the human genome, as I believe Ray pointed out earlier. Uh, and now we're trying to reverse engineer it. We're, the bi biology has become an engineering project. The engineers are involved now. And that's very exciting. That's really going to change things. So 
how did, how did I tackle some of these issues, the, 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 the larger societal issues? How does, uh, say, the economy or family? Um, and how I tried to do it in a number of different ways. Uh, one of the ways I, I worked on doing it is looking back in time and saying, OK, well, what happened the last time we roughly doubled life expectancy, when we went from 43 to, to around 80? What kinds of things changed in society? And I went through all the different disciplines and looked to see if scholars had noticed this and if they've worked on it. And it turns out that they have. And uh, if you look at economics, uh, a number of economists have written on how life expectancy affects the economy. We've become richer over time. And you can see uh, some, of the, some of the figures here, uh, the gains in life expectancy uh, just in the last century, which were around 30 years, uh, are worth about 1.2 million to the current population today. That's how much we value them at. Uh, from 70 to 1970 to 2000, uh, gains in life expectancy added 3.2 trillion to national wealth. Uh, other studies have shown, have done a comparative basis where they've shown that if you have two economies that are relatively similar uh, and one, one country has a five-year uh, life expectancy advantage, their economy will grow uh, at half a percentage point um, quicker. Uh, re real incomes will grow in, in that economy. Um, so that's interesting, right? Because you think, if you start to think about radical uh, health extension, you could say, well, uh, you know, what if a country had a 10-year advantage? What if, what if it had a 20-year advantage? How would that change things? Um, and it might be really important. Um, and by the way, the, the reason for why we get uh, richer as we can live longer has to do with health. I mean, for a long time, um, scholars understood that wealth usually begat health. If you're, if you're wealthy, you can usually um, afford to be healthy. But they didn't look at the other part of the equation until fairly recently, that health actually begets wealth. And the reason for that is because you can't be productive if you're not healthy. If you're sick, you can't, you're not working as well, you're not innovating, and you're, I mean, so health really does help produce wealth because you're productive. Okay, so what else? Uh, oh, yes, so I've got a, 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 the Mona Lisa here. Uh, and, and the reason for that uh, is when we can have longer-lived, healthier populations, innovation has the potential to grow. And the reason for that uh, is something that I, I, I didn't realize until I started doing research for the book, and that's because innovation is a late-peak field. And, um, you know, I live in Silicon Valley where we're used to seeing a lot of young people starting new companies. And so you, you tend to start to think, oh, well, it's always the young, you know, the 20-year-olds who are making all these discoveries and doing great things and changing the world. Well, it turns out that that's actually not true. Uh, da Vinci, for instance, was 50, uh, 51, I think, when he, when he painted the Mona Lisa. Uh, the person who discovered the X-ray was in his 50s. Benjamin Franklin was 46 when he did his famous kite experiment. Um, and then he went on to continue with innovations for the rest of his life. Uh, when he was 78, he invented bifocals, uh, maybe an example of how necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and, so, and so that's exciting, right? If we can have, you know, because around 40 is also, 40 or 50 is when some people's health starts to decline. And so if we, if we can pick that up, we might have so much more innovation, and, and that's exciting. Uh, education. We've become more educated over time. And in fact, the longer we live, the more education becomes valuable to us. And that's because if, once you get educated, if you, if you live another 20 years, that's great. But then if you live another 40 years, that's even better. So you're getting more bang out of your education buck, so to speak. And of course, if you're around and healthy for longer periods of time, you might want to change your career. You might go back and get re-educated. Education is going to be a growth market. Um, and it might not be the traditional type of education that we think of today. And uh, I know that the Teal folks uh, think that that's not the best way to go. Uh, but it will be some sort of education. And so this is really, the education market is going to be so exciting to watch. I think there's going to be a lot of different things happening. And because people will be living longer and healthier lives, um, there'll be more opportunity. Oops, let's go back. Uh, uh, so uh, marriage. Of course, as we've been living longer and healthier, um, we've been getting married later. Uh, I think that trend will probably continue. 
um, and new phases of life, in fact, might, might come along. Adolescence didn't used to exist. It's a new phase of life. We used to go straight from childhood to being an adult. Um, and then when we lived longer and healthier, adolescence came around. And now scholars are starting to see something that they're calling adult lessons. You're not an adolescent, but you're not really an adult. You're sort of this 30-something living in an urban area, not married. Uh, and, and that new phase, some people are calling adult lessons. So we're going to see new, more new phases of life come along and, uh, and probably more diversity in, in different choices. Uh, here's the slide I, I moved to before. Uh, the era of the 70-year-old mother. Is it on its way? Right now, we're in the era of the 40-year-old mother. Uh, age at, at first birth has been going up steadily. Uh, and because of fertility technologies, the, the advances in fertility technologies, it, I think it will be possible, and I detail why uh, in the book. I won't go into it now because I don't want to take too much time, uh, or maybe we can discuss it in the Q&A, but it, it will be possible, I think, for, uh, for women to extend their fertility longer. Um, we've already seen that the uterus uh, still works around 70 years old. It's the eggs that go bad. <laughs> Religion, right? Uh, so what about religion? Maybe, maybe a lot of folks in this crowd uh, don't think too much about it, but I wanted to make sure to include it because it's important to a lot of people around the world. Religion <clears throat> is around, if you look at uh, the data, around 90% of the world is religious. And there's pockets of the world that aren't, but they're in the minority. And so this was actually the most interesting uh, part of the book for me to write because I started out with the premise that as we can live longer and healthier lives and get further away from death, then maybe we'll be less interested in religion because we'll be, well, we won't be thinking about the afterlife. And so that was the premise that I started out with. Uh, and everything that I found when I was doing it, everything kept showing me that that was wrong. As we've doubled our life expectancy, religion has not tanked, religion has not um, decline. Uh, in fact, some people would make the argument that's even gotten stronger since com communism outlawed uh, religion in, in some countries, and as soon as that fell, religion popped back up in those communities, and it stays, tends to stay steady around 90% around the world. So the question is, is why? And what, it, there's a number of explanations. I mean, one explanation is simply that we're wired for it. Um, another explanation is that religion is about more than the afterlife. It's also about purpose. Uh, why, you know, what's the best way to live my life? What's good and evil? How should I live my life? Religion purports to answer those types of questions. And you could actually make the argument that the longer you live, the more guidance you'll need in figuring out how to live your life. So there's an, a market opportunity uh, for religions here, but they're going to have to change. They can't have more of their focus on the after. If the ones that focus more on the afterlife won't do very well. Um, the ones that will do better will be the ones that focus on purpose and how to live your life. Um, so, population. Usually the first question uh, or knee-jerk reaction to the idea of uh, longer health expectancies is a worry about population. If people don't die as quickly as we're used to them dying today, won't the world become overpopulated, is the worry. And I think that's a legitimate concern, uh, because if people die at a slower rate, population could increase. Uh, if you look at the chart I've got here, these are the world population growth rates uh, from 1950 projected out to 2050. And as you can see, world population growth rates are declining. At the same time as this is happening, of course, fertility rates are declining. And the UN has predicted that by 2050, fertility will be under 2.1, which is under replacement value. So population is projected to begin to shrink by 2050. Now, of course, that might not happen. Projections can be wrong. Um, and fertility rates could very well increase if 70-year-old women are having children. So we don't actually know what's going to happen. Population could increase uh, a little bit. Um, the, the thing that makes this not quite as scary as it could be uh, is the fact that really heavy population growth comes from births, not from fewer deaths. And the reason for that is when you have births, you can have multiple births and it can be exponential. When you have one person not dying, that's only one person. 
And so population may, may well grow, but it might not be quite as catastrophic as some people might think initially. Yes, and so then, then we have the question of resources and, the clint and pollution, essentially, right? Because if there's more people around, let's grant that maybe population will grow. There's two things here. One is, will we run, run out of resources, right? This is the Malthusian argument. That if, at some point, we're gonna just have too many people and we won't, the Earth won't be able to handle it anymore. We'll run out of water and minerals and, and, and metals. Um, and uh, that's wrong. Malthus was wrong. And the reason why Malthus was wrong is that he forgot something. He forgot one of the resources. One of the resources is humans, human capital. And the great thing about humans is they come up with ideas and new ways to provide things that we need. And this is why we have not run out of things um, as population has grown. And in fact, we have more food now than we ever did before and, and so on. And when you look at the data. Um, and so th that addresses the resource question. And then there's a the question of pollution, which is uh, what this slide is about. And there's the concern that if you look at uh, the Industrial Revolution, for example, when we started burning coal, the skies got black, right? Uh, in Britain, bronchitis was known as the British disease because everybody was coughing because they were burning so much coal that it was just visibly polluted and, and disgusting. Um, but they let it go until they reached a certain income. So you can see the Kuznets curve here. This is called the environmental Kuznets curve. And you can use this to explain how pollution will happen we hit a point of income where society feels that it can afford to start taking care of the, the pollution problem. Um, and then you start to see the environment uh, getting better over time. And this is, you can have a different Kuznets curve for different types of pollution problems. And scholars typically argue over what is, what's the number? What, what turning point income do you have to get to before we'll finally address X issue, right? Um, but nobody argues that this, very few people argue that this happens. This happens. Um, and so you could argue that, okay, well, as nanotechnology comes along, uh, the, and the next industrial revolution, or synthetic biology, I mean, maybe there'll be some type of pollution problems that we don't know about yet, and, and it's gonna be terrible. Um, and it might well be the case that there is some sort of pollution that comes out of it. Uh, but the question is, is what is the trade-off? I mean, that's what we always have to be asking ourselves. And maybe we put up with it for a little while and then we fix it and we move along and, and we progress. So that's a way to, uh, to think about uh, pollution and, and environmental issues in a, in a longer lived world. So of course I have to get to some potentially negative things. That, you know, I've been called an optimist. Uh, but I'm not all optimistic. There are some potential things that could be a problem in this world when we can live longer and healthier lives, uh, which in general I think is good. Uh, but let's, let's think about the longevity divide for a minute and inequality in the world. Um, I, here I've got a chart of the top 10 countries uh, in life expectancy. Monaco's at the top, of course, around 90 years, the south of France. People there live quite well. It's a small community uh, and they're wealthy. Uh, so that's great for them. Notice that the U.S. is not in the top 10. I think we're down somewhere around 70, which is not so great. Uh, here are the bottom 10 countries. Angola is down around 38 years. A difference internationally between 38 years and around 90. That's over 50 years. That's an entire lifetime. I mean, Steve Jobs lived barely, I mean, lived 56. So, you know, that's, that's a really big starting point, a really big divide that we're starting from in the first place. Within the United States, there's divides as well, not quite as big, but still bigger than I had expected to find before I did the research. Uh, an Asian-American woman in New Jersey has a life expectancy of around 91 years, which is great. Uh, but a, a Native American man in South Dakota has a life expectancy of 58 years. So we're looking at a 33 year difference, which is pretty significant. 
So when longevity technologies do finally hit the market, when some of uh, Dr. Badalot's work gets widespread, uh, when we manage to hack the genome in effective ways to cure diseases using gene therapy, uh, will that, that will be expensive probably at first. Uh, and the first people to use that are going to be the wealthy people because wealthy people always get access to new innovations first. Um, and in some ways that's good because they put up a lot of capital for things that don't work really well in the beginning. All right? Think about cell phones. What cell phones looked like in the beginning, these big suitcases, and then there were big bricks, uh, and everybody thought they were crazy for carrying these things around. But they were pumping money into it because they wanted, they wanted to be able to use these things. And then eventually development got better and we have these small, amazing cell phones. And places like Africa got to completely skip landlines and went straight to cell phones. So the question is, is how big will the lag be between the wealthy and the poor getting access to longevity technologies? Because as we've seen, health is incredibly important to wealth. So the healthier you are, the richer you are. So you can imagine how if there's a long period of time between different segments of society getting access to these technologies, we could see serious, serious divides and potentially unrest. I mean, people, we've got protesters out in the streets today protesting in front of people's offices and houses over economics. But what about when it comes to their life? What if they think that they're literally fighting for their life? We could have trouble. So. Uh, I want to make you feel not so bad about this. So I, here, here's a, 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 some data on how the distribution of technology is actually speeding up over time. So to the extent that biology is becoming an information technology, perhaps it will fit in with this list. It took 46 years for a quarter of the population to get access to electricity, 35 for the telephone, 16 for the personal computer, 13 for the cell phone, seven for internet access. And so that's going in the right direction. And we can hope that biotechnology will follow that trajectory, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, so this is, this is the last slide. One, one, one of the other things I typically hear when, when I'm speaking about this subject is that, well, you know, even if everything could be great and we could extend our health expectancy to 150 years, maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe it's just unnatural. It's, it's this weird, crazy thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to play God. Um, and my response to that is, well, what is it, why is an 80-year lifespan uh, natural? It would have been, you know, if we talked to somebody back in 1850, it would have been 43, right? And we go all along the line. And so at what point do you decide what is natural? I mean, back when this guy was around, fur was the only fashion option, right? Now we have clothes and glasses and laser eye surgery, and we keep improving ourselves. And my response is that it's entirely natural for humans to want to improve themselves and for humans to make themselves healthier and better, and that's what's natural. So following and pushing for greater health extension is really the natural thing to do, the human thing to do. Um, and so I have a chapter in the book that addresses all the different uh, questions surrounding that. Um, and then the one thing I want to end with is the idea about aging being set in stone. You know, for the longest time, and in fact, uh, demographers have constantly been saying, you know, oh, we'll never pass this number in life expectancy, we'll never pass this number, and on and on, and, um, and of course, we keep doing it. And there's this idea that lifespan is set in stone. There's a ceiling, and we can never pass it. The oldest person who have ever lived is 122, and we are never going to pass that. That's what some people say. Um, but what we've learned recently is that aging is plastic. It is not set in stone. Just like the brain is plastic, we've learned that people can st kill, still keep learning as they get older. Older brains are plastic. Aging is plastic, too. There's research all, that's been done all over the world where you can show that by doing gene tweaks on lab animals, you can slow down aging. For instance, Cynthia Kenyon at UCSF does experiments on worms where she makes a couple of tweaks, and they live six times longer 
than they would have lived otherwise. But not just longer, healthier. They're younger, and the reason they're younger and they get disease uh, at a slower rate than the normal worms is because she's slowed down aging by hacking their code. And we're on the cusp of a revolution where we're going to be able to hack our code in different ways to do different things. And that's exciting, and it's something that we should really be pushing for because we do want to be healthier for longer periods of time because there's all sorts of good things associated with it. But this kind of stuff doesn't happen just on its own. I mean, I can stand up here and tell you that, look, you know, this is going to happen. Dr. Badalak's work is amazing, and Ray Kurzweil's doing great things, and there's all these other scientists who are doing incredible things, and engineers in Silicon Valley who are working on reverse engineering biology. But they shouldn't be alone. And so I actually make the call in my book, and I'm going to make it right now, is that we need to support these people. I mean, not only do they need financial support from governments and private industry and, uh, and philanthropists, but they also need social support. I mean, for the longest time, working on anything related to aging was a death wish, really, if you were in academia. I mean, that sounded flaky. It sounded like snake oil. Uh, but now, people who are working in that field are starting to gain respect, and they should be because they're making great advances. And we have to support them as a society, journalists and policymakers and educators and all sorts of different types of people who think about these things and who care about being healthy longer should get involved. Because if we're not, this stuff will still happen, but it'll happen more slowly, and we, not, we might not be around to take advantage of it. And so I'm hoping that everyone here will get involved and do something, do whatever you can. If you're a graphic designer, maybe you can help some of these people explain their ideas better uh, to the public. Uh, and, and so on. So, um, so that's, uh, that's the final thing that I'll say, and then uh, we have three minutes for questions. Which, thank you. How much of the advances in uh, life expectancy come from people, like adults living longer, and how much of it comes from people just not dying in childhood? Right. So I tried to make that point earlier, uh, is that most of the gains, when you look at that chart, uh, most of the gains early on, in the, in the first part of that curve, were made from things that were done earlier on in life, like uh, infant mortality declining and, uh, and better nutrition and, and better ways to treat infectious disease that would kill a lot of people early on in life. Um, but in the second half of the 20th century, we've been making progress because chronic disease didn't come along until more of us made it to be older, right? So we didn't even start thinking about those things until cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's even entered our lexicon. That wasn't even part of our world until relatively recently. And so now we're starting to tackle those things. And you know, obviously, we're not there yet. We haven't cured heart disease or Alzheimer's. We've had some great progress in cancer. Uh, not completely curing it, of course, but in certain cases, we've been managed to save people, uh, and we're getting better at it. And, so, and chronic disease also is setting in at later and later ages than it used to before, which goes to show that some of the things we did to help people at the beginning of life are also helping through life. Over here. Uh, currently, there's a big uh, controversy in the nation about an increase of bus loss. Uh, Medicare is exponentially growing. A lot of people are trying to put a cap on it. So, you accounted for the economic boom and positivity of the long run. But how do you account for the fact that all these technologies will keep people alive longer? It costs a lot of money. Right. That's a very good question. So the, the question, just to repeat quickly, is. How do you, th the question, just to repeat quickly, is how do you think about the growth in life expectancy, but also the rising cost of health care, and how will that play out? Right. So one of the things I often hear is, well, can we even afford to live longer? And that's because health care costs are so expensive, and we know that we're, the majority of costs uh, occur, occur near the end of life when we're trying to save people. Um, and there's a couple of different ways. I mean, that's a difficult question to answer because we don't know which technologies are going to come along at what time and in what order. Um, uh, but you can think, I mean, the way I like to think about it is there's, 
I mean, there is a potential for healthcare to become more expensive depending on how expensive repairs are, but there's also the potential for healthcare to actually become cheaper. And so here's how you could think about it. Imagine somebody today who has heart disease. They're put on a lot of expensive drugs. They typically have many uh, emergency trips to the hospital and the, all the costs that are associated with that. They might have heart surgery, but it doesn't really fix them. It just patches them up for a little while and gives them some extra years. Or we could think about the future, when tissue engineers are successful in growing a brand new heart. So somebody has heart disease, they go to the doctor, doctor says, oh, you know what? You're gonna need a new heart. And they grow a brand new heart for that person out of their own adult stem cells and replace it. And guess what? They're not on any of those expensive drugs. They're not taking all those trips to the hospital. And they're only having one surgery instead of potentially more. And so there's a potential for healthcare costs to come down. Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions, but thank you, Sonia. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so stay in your seats. We were supposed to have a break right now, but Peter Thiel is here and he has to go, so we're gonna bring him on stage very shortly, and then we're gonna have the break immediately afterwards. So the change is 